நம்முடைய தமிழ் மொழி உலகிலேயே மிகவும் தொன்மையான மொழி எந்த தேசத்திடம் இருக்கின்றதோ அந்த தேசத்திடம் பெருமிதம் பொங்க வேண்டுமா கூடாதா சொல்லு செம்மொழி வலையொலி யூடியூப் சேனல் இந்த சேனலின் மூலமாக அந்த வலையொலியின் மூலமாக பல்வேறு தகவல்களை தினந்தோறும் நாங்கள் வழங்கி கொண்டிருக்கக்கூடிய அந்த நிலையில் சிலப்பதிகாரம் என்ற தலைப்பில் ஒவ்வொரு பகுதியாக வழங்கக்கூடிய அந்த தொகுப்பை முழுமையாக கண்டு பார்க்கலாம் title of this lecture is on friendship aristotle and thiruvalluvar the scrutiny of friendship was an integral part of moral and political philosophy in the past as evidenced by plato's discussion of it in his dialogues lysis and symposium and aristotle's thorough examination of it in nicomachean ethics the greatest of roman orators cicero deals with friendship in his treatise de amicitia montaigne's essays an unsystematic but a thorough record of the french writers reflections on his life his reading contemporary events and on general moral problems has one chapter on friendship he is a junior english contemporary francis bacon wrote one essay on the subject in 1612 and another in 1625 containing clear echoes of the french peace the highest form of love in plato's view is a spirited companionship between two persons of the same sex untouched by erotism in the dialogue called the lysis since the subject is friendship or rather the attraction of one person for another in all its varieties he chooses an appropriate setting in which socrates two school boys who are fast friends and two youths who are their admirers are the chief characters advising the boys that they should be useful and good if they are to win friends socrates starts examining homer's statement that the gods make friends by drawing like to like he finally demonstrates that neither similars nor opposites can be friends to each other the dialogue takes us nowhere as socrates himself indulges in sophistic and fallacious arguments without throwing any valuable hint he is clearly trapped by the ambiguities of the greek word and what emerges is an unattractive and baffling view of friendship we feel that critics are just in rejecting these dialogues the lysis Euthyphro, Lacus, and Charmides, as each of these has failed in its in its attempt to define a single virtue, it is in the symposium that Plato succeeds famously in describing his unique concept of love, both with regard to content and form. There are vital differences. between plato's and aristotle's ethics and this is especially true of their approach to friendship 
Plato contends that only the philosopher can be truly happy as he alone at the end of a long and arduous training learns to ten, turn away from the confusing world of ordinary experience to contemplate the forms. Aristotle's view is more mundane. To him, moral virtue is not out of the reach of common man. Though like Plato, Aristotle holds the contemplative life to be superior to the life of action, he takes the virtues associated with the latter to be characteristic of human beings as human beings. If according to Plato, it is a degradation for the philosopher to come down to the solid earth after having gained a vision of the good, for Aristotle, practical activity in the social and political sphere is a typically human. It is Cicero who regards friendship as the greatest of all the gifts the gods have bestowed upon mankind, the single exception being wisdom. Cicero places friendship above every other human concern that can be imagined. He says, nothing in the whole world is so completely in harmony with nature and nothing so utterly right in prosperity and adversity alike. Examining the origins of friendship, Cicero claims that they lie in something primeval and noble, something emanating directly from the actual processes of nature. It must be a product of nature rather than of any deficiency. It cannot under any circumstances be derived from any calculation of potential profit. And he says, it comes from a feeling of affection an inclination of the heart. These are Cicero's observations on friendship. As a proof, he mentions the fact that it is from love, Amar, that the word friendship, Amichitya, is derived. Cicero repeatedly asserts that only good men have the capacity to be good friends and that friendship of the virtuous is desirable for its own sake and for itself. Nature abhors solitude and for any human being, the best support of all is a good friend. The Roman philosopher, that is Cicero, draws our attention to the inspired Greek poem in which Empedocles sang that all things in nature and the universe, whether stationary or moving, are united by friendship. Montaigne's essay on friendship is very different from the rest of his work. In as much as it is a passionately moving, intensely felt and a tender account of his love for his friend La Buiti. That is the name of his friend as well as a grand celebration of friendship itself. He makes a distinction between what he calls acquaintance and a sovereign and perfect friendship, which he concedes is rarely found. But in the friendship I speak of, he says, friends mix and work themselves into one piece with so universally a mixture that there is no more sign of the seam by which they were first conjoined. All things, wills, thoughts, opinions, goods, wives, children, honors and lives being in effect common between them and that absolute concurrence of affections being no other than one soul in two bodies according to the very proper definition 
of Aristotle, they can neither lend nor give anything to one another. Common friendship, the philosopher, French philosopher says, common friendship will admit of division. One may love the beauty of this person, the good humor of that, the liberality of a third, the paternal affection of a fourth, the fraternal love of a fifth, and so the rest. But this friendship that possesses the whole soul and their rules and sways with an absolute sovereignty cannot possibly admit a rival. Unlike his predecessors, Montaigne explores the range of human activity and the sensibility without methodically analyzing or systematizing it. He is not concerned to arrive at a systematic corpus of knowledge about man, since for him philosophy is a form of activity rather than a description of ultimate truth. His purpose is more personal than theoretical, more poetic than philosophical. What may alienate him from his readers is the theme of vanity or of human insignificance that is at the heart of his vision of life. To him, man is no more than a beast. His cynicism rears its ugly head in his comparison between friendship and the love we bear to women. He says, the fire of this, I confess, is more active, more eager and more sharp. But withal, it is more precipitant, fickle, that is love of man for woman. He has nothing but contempt for this. It is more precipitant fickle, moving and inconstant, a fever subject to intermissions and paroxysms that has ceased but on the part of us, on one part of us. Whereas in friendship, it is a general and universal fire, but a temp temperate and equal, a constant established heat, all gentle and smooth without poignancy or roughness. Moreover, in love, he says, it is no other than frantic desire for that which flies from us. Understandably, Bacon was inspired by this French philosopher's treatment of the subject. Bacon's essays are found to be cold and practical compared to other Renaissance writings on friendship, though the one called on friendship is an eloquent plea for the need for friendship. The first to two fruits of friendship, Bacon says, are peace in the emotions and support of the judgment. He says, for friendship maketh indeed a fair day in the affections, from storm and tempest, but it maketh the daylight in the understanding out of darkness and the confusion of thoughts. These are followed by the last fruit, which is aid and bearing a part in all actions and occasions. But in other essays, where his moral philosophy smacks of Machiavelli, Bacon is seen to be skeptical of both love and friendship. Of love, he writes, it is a strange thing to note the excess of this passion, that is, the love of man for woman. It is a strange thing to note the excess of this passion. You may observe that amongst all the great and worthy persons whereof the memory remaineth, either ancient or recent, there is not one that has been transported to the mad degree of love, which shows that great spirits and great business do keep out this weak passion. Though Bacon might have known about the celebrated friendship of 
Michelangelo and the Cavalieri, Montaigne and La Boethi, Sir Philip Sidney and Languet. He asserts that the French are chiefly a means to power. In his discussion of friendship, Bacon can never be as profound as Aristotle or Thirwaldwar, but all the time gives expression to his cynicism and distrust of man. He says, love your friend as if he were to become your enemy and your enemy as if he were to become your friend. Do not betray even to your friend too much of your real purpose and thoughts. In conversation, ask questions of questions oftener than you express opinions. And when you speak, offer data and information rather than beliefs and judgments. This is how, according to him, one should treat one's friend. Of all these meditations on friendship, the one that is closer to Thiruvalluvar is that of Aristotle. The world view that has given birth to Montaigne's and Bacon's Bacon's cynical attitudes to love and friendship would have been Valdivar's abhorrence. Even Cicero's account in the form of a discussion sounds a little too calculating and appears to be meant mainly for his own society and his own times as he is interested in considering how far personal friendship is compatible with political oppositions that were inevitable during his period. While proceeding from life's experiences to recent universal judgments, while asserting emphatically that virtue and vice are within the power of homo sapiens, and especially while elevating friendship to a very high level in the list of universal human concerns, Aristotle reminds us more of Thiruvalluvar than of any of his own Western disciples. While commenting on the arrangement of chapters in Tirukkural, F. W. Ellis, an English polyglot, writes, this is what he says about the various chapters in Tirukkural. In the chapters which precede this, that is the chapter on self-control, Adakam Udaimai. The author treats on the virtues and duties of domestic life which affect others and in those that succeed with a few exceptions on the habits, good and bad, which however beneficial or hurtful to others, more immediately affect the individual subject to them and which may all be considered as proceeding from self-control or the opposite. 